Hey, everybody. Welcome to 5 O'Clock Somewhere. We're live in the Two Sweet Social Club in Napa Valley. And tonight, we have a very fun and special show for you. We have Jonathan Baruch, the CEO of Local Measure, and he is joining us, Johnny Moda and I. I'm Susan Quinn. Johnny Moda, that's me. Nice to meet you. And uh, right before we get to the show, we want to remind you that you can join the show on camera with us right now by going to the event page on tootsuite.com and clicking join on camera. This is the only social video show that I know of that you can join the show live by just logging in in real time. So we hope to see you soon. If you're too shy to do that, you can tweet us at Toot Social, T-O-U-T Social, and we will be taking your questions from our smartphone. But if they're even shyer, they could also call in, correct? They could call, yeah. So if you don't want sure to be on waiting. video, you could call in, you could talk to us, tweet yes, us. Yes, you can, you can join and then just talk to us if you haven't taken your curlers out or something, you know, one of those things. It's like uh, the old uh, Skype messaging from Boardwalk, you just up here, no pants. Yeah. <laughs> Jetsons used to have an episode where you'd have a mask in the morning before you do your video call. I lo I remember that very well. I love that. Judy Jetson, I think. Or was it Jane? Jane Jetson. Which Jane. one's the mom? I don't Yeah, Jane, Jane. the mom. <laughs> and so we are also, since we are live in Napa Valley, do you do you even drink wine? Or do you like beer? No, I don't not really. Yeah. Not well I'm often. drinking wine and we are drinking the Tablas Creek Vineyard wines and we have a little assortment here from Paso Robles, California. Left behind by Scott Lewis from V Wine Cellars. He was here last night. We did an awesome blind taste thing, and we, he revealed these these really fun wines. If you ever get to Napa Valley, you have to go to Yauntville, which is the capital of food for California and maybe the United States. I think per capita they have more food uh, experts than you know. Thomas Keller lives there, stuff like that. So. Uh, anyway, make your way down to V Wine Cellar and tell Scott Lewis hi. They they have a cigar bar and they give sabering lessons, so you can saber your own bottle of champagne there. So it's fun, it's pretty good. So let's get straight into the show. We have James Taylor joining us live from Vancouver, correct? Yes, it's, it's sunny here today in Vancouver. There's no rain, which is is unusual for this place. <laughs> well, you, we're bringing in a little, little Napa Valley over to you. And Jonathan Baruch, who is in Sydney, correct? Yeah, we've got an international show today. <laughs> we yeah. sure do. Good roundabout for the circle. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, let's get, let's get going right into it. We, we have, so Jonathan, as I mentioned, is the CEO of Local Measure, and we're going to be talking about how the barriers between the way businesses and consumers communicate are washing away and how social media technologies are creating a much more personalized experience for consumers. So, Jonathan, can you quickly tell us who you are, what sort of you're obsessive about, and what, what made you get on this roller coaster ride? What I'm obsessed about, obsessive? Um, probably skiing. I'm a mad keen skier and obviously obsessed about my two kids. Um, that, that's probably about the only thing that I really stress about. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, Australian entrepreneur. We've got um, a location-based technology called Local Measure. Um, you can go to getlocalmeasure.com to find out more. What we have built is, I suppose, Google Analytics for the real world. We've built some social tools for bricks and mortar businesses to understand what their consumers are saying in real time. So if you kind of walk into a Macy's and you Instagram a photo of the shoes that you're thinking about buying, but don't mention the word Macy's, you know, we can roll that up in a business to kind of understand what products, what services, and even who are the individuals who are talking about products in a particular retail environment. All right. Well, that that seems to take it quite a step further than the without even mentioning brand ever. Marketing I've seen before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there are a lot of um, really great social media tools that kind of have really nailed listening to brands. So if you're Coca-Cola you've got a choice of probably a hundred different products which can cut that data in heaps of different ways which add a lot of value to the Coca-Cola company. If you're a retail chain of coffee stores or you've got a chain of cinemas 
or you're in fact even at just a small restaurant, you know, a lot of those social tools break down because there are folks in your proper in your premises who are sharing, you know, Instagram photos, four square check ins, you know, tweeting, tagging to Facebook. Uh, and that kind of paradigm of listening to a brand breaks. You know, so we, we do work for a nightclub out here in Sydney called Ivy. I V Y. You can imagine how many mentions of the word Ivy there are every second on Twitter. You know, but most of those have got nothing to do with this nightclub. So if they kind of want to know what's going on in their club on a Saturday night, is the act any good? You know, are they getting good buzz? How many people are there? Are there any influences kind of in the audience? Is there any feedback about their product or service? You know, most of the current tools kind of short of answering those questions. Um, I think the really interesting thing is, as I was saying earlier, it, it's not so much the, you know, the fact that we're just another social platform. I think what we're doing is we're leveraging really great conversations that are already happening on social, and we're kind of making sense of it, and we're extracting kind of actionable data and insight. So, you know, if you're in the queue for a coffee store, and you Instagram a photo or you check in, you know, by the time that you get to the counter, you know, your photo, your bio, how many times you've be, been there could be up on the iPad of the barista. You know, and that's a really, really powerful way to engage your clients, whether or not they've mentioned your brand. Because you've got advocates kind of in physical businesses who are kind of crying out for service and for, for engagement and then kind of not getting it because brands aren't quite there yet. So I suppose tools like Local Measure help make it really easy for kind of bricks and mortar businesses to kind of listen, understand, and engage with, you know, their clients on the ground in their stores. That's exciting. That's really fantastic. I love it. I can't wait to see it. No, How far along are you on the on the launch pad? So we're about six weeks in. Uh, six and weeks. we've got some really, really big clients who are already using it, like shopping malls, uh, retail chains, small businesses, restaurants, nightclubs, we've got a few big airports using it. I'm out in Singapore next week meeting with um, some very large kind of consumer facing kind of lifestyle entertainment businesses as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's six weeks, but it feels kind of like two years. Like we've had um, a really interesting, yeah. diverse group of people who are using our, our tools. Sure. So let's get into uh, the, a quick summary of social networks that you find to be your favorites and how businesses are using them well. So look, I, you know, obviously because of what I do, we keep on top of kind of all of them. I suppose one thing that we've been quite surprised at with Local Measure and actually helping you know, bigger companies start to use our tools to engage is just how prevalent something like Instagram is. Um, and really in the retail context as well, you have folks who are, every time they go to a venue, they'll Instagram. I was speaking to someone in Singapore, I think last week, who said when he was young, you know, in restaurants you would see kids saying grace before their meal. And these days when you're in a restaurant in Singapore, you see kids Instagramming a photo of their food before their meal. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of like in 10 years, social behavior has gone from, you know, praying before your meal to sharing a photo on social. Mm. I think why that's really powerful is for that restaurant, you know, previously there would have been no way for them to have known who their clients were on any given night. You know, they might sell 100 tables, take money from 100 customers, maybe they might recognize one face, and then all those folks walk out the door. Now, I suppose, with kind of digital exhaust that comes from social media, suddenly you can start realizing, oh, hey, you know, those 20 people, have he been here before? Well, that girl over there is actually a journalist. And, you know, we've just seen she's tweeted a photo of her meal. So for me, I think particularly the visual networks like Instagram are really interesting. And we're sort of starting to see businesses engage on Instagram. And even things now like Vine that Twitter released, you know, I think have a lot of power for businesses and brands. I think, you know, no one's kind of really nailed video yet. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of short format kind of feels like it might be a good halfway step between kind of photo and video, full video. I love that you used the food example. We had the founders of Forkly and Food Spotting. Were you here that night? I missed it. Nobody I know James was here. And we also had, we also had chocolate covered bacon that night. So you missed, that oh, was yeah. a, 
I think yeah. there would be less problems in the world if more things were just wrapped in bacon. Everyone would just be a lot more. Money. Or chocolate. It doesn't really matter. Or chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate and bacon. But aside from that, um, we did have the, the fa- both founders, founder of Forkley and the founder of Food Spotting on that night. And they were, we were talking about how the uh, restaurants in New York and some others are banning photography with your phone in restaurants, which seems to me like the worst. They said they'll they'll give you a pre-shot photo from the kitchen, and I'm saying, uh, have you ever seen a Burger King billboard? That is not what a Burger King burger looks like, so I want to know what my friend took a picture of it, not what you gave me. Have have you seen any? I think they're missing out that sharing opportunity, which is free and better than any publicity you could buy. I have, have you have you seen any of the adverts in any stores yet in in or coffee shops in uh, San Francisco uh, where they have the Google Glass and then they have the score through it because yeah. there's places where they actually don't want you wearing your Google Glasses. And so so I think it's going to become so ubiquitous with what we're doing. Um, you know, it's just there's there's no way of really stopping this. And we, when you've got the ability to for people printing 3D guns from anywhere in the world. Really, the, the 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 problem of people taking photographs of the foods that a restaurant's making are the, are the at least the at least the problems. I think it's just it's out there. But I mean, the, the crazy thing is, I mean, I was reading a report last night that you know, particularly in Asia, a really significant portion of revenue comes from you know peer recommendations, peer review, review sites, mm-hmm. seeing that your friend has been to this restaurant. Like it's the biggest word of mouth kind of opportunity for a restaurant to actually, you know, if they have somebody saying something nice about their food and a thousand of their friends sees it, like why wouldn't you want that to happen? Like they're going to leave the restaurant and tell their friends anyway. Why not encourage your clients to kind of share good experiences? So for me that just is mind-boggling and really those businesses deserve to go bankrupt because... Like what they're saying is like we don't want our customers telling anyone else about what we're doing. So I, I hope there are other businesses in those areas who spring up who are kind of open to good, bad and ugly and everything in between and they're just kind of honest and they respond to the negative and they thank the positive. And I think that's a much better, better way of doing business rather than, you know, damping out communication. Yeah, about a week ago, we had the EP birds on the show, too, and they said, you know, the things that are most shareable are things that are enjoyable. We can go home and watch something, shoot 'em up show, and some kind of killer killer thing, you know, on, on the movies where there's a lot of violence and stuff, and that's very popular when you go home and you're alone. But the things that are shared are happy stories and good news and fun things and, and, and positive positive videos and they're the they're the authors of the viral video video manifesto and they do like things like jumping bouncy balls and things like that i mean our data completely backs that up like we're doing a lot of work with a lot of different restaurants and hotel chains who are petrified about social and oh my god what if somebody says something bad and then you look at the data and 99 percent is positive and they go, oh, my God, like, we have not been engaging with these folks. We haven't been responding. They're like, can we use this content to share it? And, I, and I'm like, well, yes, that's the whole point of kind of social. They're great advocates of your products and services. Like, use them to your advantage. With, yeah, bring them in closer. And even, Engage with them. Even with that 1% you're saying, like, 90% of them is, is good um, good. Um, information and you know 10 percent is you know someone said something bad about you you'd want to know i mean with social media when someone says something bad about you it's, it's very instant and you, it's good to know because you want to respond right away and, and be on top of that to there you want to take that experience from them and turn it around and how can you make that good for your brand and how can you take that, that sour thing out of their mouth that can be a greater opportunity than even a good comment right and what I don't understand yet, and I kind of do understand it, but what still surprises me is that traditional businesses will respond to, you know, feedback forms. If you fill out a feedback note, you pop it in a little box. They'll respond to email. If somebody in a store is complaining, they'll go up to the person and try and resolve it. But as soon as it happens on social, it's kind of scary. <laughs> but, and they don't, want to, they don't want to deal with it. But you kind of say to them, well, had this person said the same thing in person, you would have tried to resolve the problem. Why are you not listening? Why are you ignoring something that's digital? 
that's going to have a much bigger impact to touch more people. So it kind of doesn't really make sense. Just a question to Jonathan, just in terms of the business model, what you do. I noticed that obviously the app is is, is free and you're trying to get user adoption, but you, you made a decision to to charge the the stores um, and the and the brands for for uh, for using it and accessing the data. Was when you initially looked to launch the the product was did you consider just making it completely free in order to get mass adoption first and then adding a, a revenue model or was it really you said you know from from day one we want to make this a you know a, 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 a viable kind of cash flow type business look I mean local measure is a business tool we think even where we are at now six weeks in we're adding like a lot of um, value for businesses and we've got some really big brands that have validated that they're using it they're actually not only seeing what consumers are saying, but we're getting feedback now about how their strategy has changed um, and how you know we've helped them improve their business and, and retain and engage customers. So we were kind of seeing there thinking, you know, we're actually adding value. There are costs to crunch this data. There's costs to kind of manage a relationship with a client. Um, it didn't really make sense for us to do something for free, um, but it, it's moderate costs. Like for a small business, it's 59 US. If you've got one store, if you've got multiple outlets, it's 99 and then obviously for enterprise clients, it's a subscription on a per store basis. So we're not talking like a hell of a lot of money um, mm -hmm. and you know, our thinking is, let's take the case of a restaurant, if we can help that restaurant get one consumer back to buy another meal or if because of a positive experience we can get a friend to come back or if we can you know, retain an extra client, like all we need is one extra meal or one extra table to be sold, you know, for a restaurant, and we've kind of covered our costs. So we kind of think that's reasonable. Um, and obviously, we've got really talented engineers who we're paying to build this product. So we kind of didn't want to do like a mass kind of freemium kind of product. But yeah, we, we certainly could have. A lot of people have done that really well. And, and uh, do you see it, you know, certainly for the the in the short term, being this kind of standalone um, product for for brands and for stores? Or, or are you looking at trying to make it to really integrate it with other with other platforms that are in that same thing in terms of you know reputation management? So we, we were talking about before we came into like Hootsuite. So now if I'm a brand, I can see in addition to my the Twitter stream around my brand, I can also see um, you know your feed as well. Yeah, I mean I think that what you've just said is the core point and the core difference. Like there are other tools that let you listen to your followers and your friends and let you engage with the people who you already know are part of your community. What our tool does is says, let's look at everybody else. Let's look at all of the other content that's being shared about your brand in your store that you're missing because they're not your fans and your followers. So if somebody walks into a store and Instagrams a photo and they're not, you know, you're not following them or they haven't even mentioned the name of your store, like we pick that up. So yeah, clearly it's complementary with a lot of those other products that you've just said. It's even complementary with a point of sale. Like if you've got an iPad at your point of sale, and we can throw up in real time what's going on in that particular store. You know, super valuable. I so suppose at the moment we're just trying to think. Of, you know, we've we've got a really strong role out to keep on delivering value, and I suppose we'll integrate where it makes sense if it helps us reach, you know, a lot of merchants, um, and it commercially makes sense. Yeah, we, you know, we'd be really happy to. We're having some of those discussions now. So, so, so we, have, we do have a Twitter question, actually. Let me flip this in here. We've got a Twitter question from Tia at uh, Wine Inc. by Tia. And she asks, we're in the wine industry here. Uh, what is your best, uh, what are the best industries that are taking advantage of social media and how are they doing it? Look, I, I don't want to profess to be an expert in all spaces. There's enough social media experts that you could probably um, to chat to. I suppose what we know really well with arts all this kind of hospitality, food, hotels, retail, that kind of seems to be our sweet spot. Um, so we've got a lot of bars, clubs, restaurants, cafes, you know, hotels, cinemas, those kinds of businesses. Um, and some do it better than others, um, to be honest. What was surprising was outside of the US, um, I suppose the next sort of biggest opportunity that we see is in Asia. Like you look at countries like the Philippines, you look at Indonesia, you look at Singapore, and there's just a significant volume of conversation 
and you've got brands there who just kind of naturally get social and they're kind of starting to engage with their consumers to do giveaways, to do offers, to do your store, kind of share your experience. And even like I think Starbucks have been, you know, really good at positioning themselves on something like Instagram as a place that you go to and then you share a photo. I think the biggest, I think, to your point about the restaurants, I think actually doing that complete opposite of what you're saying is happening in New York kind of is really valuable. Encourage your, your consumers to share a photo of like your product, your service, their experience in your premises. Um, that's kind of really powerful. And we're starting to see that. Like you see at store entrances, like a little Facebook logo and then you saw a little Twitter logo. And now you're seeing like other logos where businesses are saying, hey, you're in our store, you know, tweet us, talk about us and we'll respond. I think yeah. where we're going and, and what we're really excited about is sort of in service industries where we can get that message to the right person at the right time to actually make a difference. So, you know, if I'm in a department store and I'm you know, tweeting about the shoes I want to buy or saying, hey, there's no one here to serve me, if we could route that message to the floor manager, you know, with your avatar and your comment, and they can walk over and go, hey, Jonathan, sorry you're having a bad experience. Those shoes look great. Let me help you buy them. Mm-hmm. You know, that, I think that's really powerful. So I think businesses that are starting to do it well are kind of retail-facing services. Um, I probably don't want to call anyone specifically out. I mean, I did with Starbucks, but there, there are a bunch of brands who are doing some really clever things. Sure. I actually want to ask you a question that, that you know, we hear a lot in social media and hopefully less and less as, as things get more well understood by by the industries, but what is the ROI? What's the return on investment of social? What's the return on investment of listening to your customer? Because you get that question in social media where you don't get it when there's a complaint in your store. Yeah. So so how do you rectify how do you how do you answer that? Um, look I hear that every day. Yeah. I think that, as you've actually just said, I think we're sitting across almost two business disciplines. We're very much an operational tool. And I'll give you an example in a minute of a client that we've got that's um, a gelato chain across Asia. And we're a marketing tool because you've got people talking about your products and services and clearly you have to engage with them. And I think with all forms of marketing, it's really tough to track ROI. I mean, I, I don't think you know television executives or newspaper executives do a better job of explaining the ROI, you know, and social media executives. I suppose the one thing that we can do that adds a layer of comfort to a bricks and mortar store is that we're showing businesses, consumers who are already in their properties who are spending money with them. So often they're already taking photos of the products or services they've already paid for or consumed. So we're saying these are actually your clients. They have paid for a service. Like engage with them or don't, but it's your kind of risk. I suppose where we can take that to is, you know, what we show businesses on our on local measure is, hey, Jonathan's walked in. This is the fifth time he's been there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you engage with him on the fourth time and he came back for a fifth time, that's ROI. We've delivered as a result of social media and other factors, of course. We've got him back in your store one more time. He has spent another $50. You know, and we can pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, we've delivered ROI. Um, I think we're getting to the point of sale. And you can kind of link a social profile back to a specific consumer. And that's kind of really exciting. And I think when you can do that, a lot of these arguments will go away. Because if you can see that you've targeted someone with a Facebook ad, and then they've walked into one of your stores and spent $100 on the point of sale, you know, it's a mm-hmm. really clear link. And in terms of this data, how open is this data? Because let's say if I'm in Starbucks and I'm complaining because the length of the queue is too long or the uh, it's taking, you know, the, the coffee I've just been served is not very good. That's obviously a great opportunity for Pete's Coffee or for another brand to come in. Or if you're in a restaurant and saying, you know, queue's really long here or food's not good, that's a great opportunity for, for competitive brands to come in. It depends how cheeky you want to be, right? But yeah, I mean, it's open <laughs> data. It's public. People are sharing it willingly. I think you have to remember, though, um, they are in a competitor's outlet, and it could be seen as a little bit spammy. So I think there's a fine line. I think you can do it really cleverly, and I think you can come off as spamming people. So I think if you can find the balance somewhere in between, that could be really cool. Um, 
but it, you know, it could be unless you're really savvy, it could be a massive brand, you know, risk to Pete to do that to Starbucks. Yeah. But you're completely yeah. right. Even at a basic level, you know, we have clients who are not only listening to their own stores, but they're listening to their competitors' store just across the hall. So if I'm a department, if I'm Macy's and I want to know what's happening in the Nordstrom just down the road, who are their clients, who are their champion clients, what are their products and services, where do their clients come from, you know, we've got that data. You know, Macy's so you have, to be, you have to be really careful. You could watch it, but whether or not you respond to it, you have to do that with uh, a tender touch for sure. Yeah, completely. But That's even crazy. at a higher level, like there's nothing wrong with following uh, or just starting to engage. Like if I'm Macy's and there's folks who are talking about fashion in Nordstrom's, yeah, follow them. I mean, they're clients in your catchment area in a similar kind of retail space, by all means, like, you know, engage with those folks. So I suppose that's something that we're seeing and the behavior we're seeing, and I think that's really cool. What about yeah. in terms uh, like festivals? Have you obviously we've got a large grouping of, of people together, but they're not using necessarily you know um, you know hashtags or, or or a Twitter handle for a festival, but they're they're all in one physical space and they're talking mm -hmm. about an event or they're talking about a band. Have you started doing any tests any um, tests with with uh, with large scale events like that? We've had a couple who are using it um, and they're getting good results. I suppose it's not the use case that we've got kind of, you know, defined in our head. Like, for us, the best types of businesses are permanent physical locations and where we can add value to them over the long term. You know, an event happens for a few hours and clearly will surface some great data for them. But, you know, over the course of a year or six months, like, we can actually demonstrate that we're adding a lot of value to a retail business, to a club, to a restaurant, to an airport. Um, it's much harder to do that for, a, you know, a transient event. Uh, event managers and actual event operators at physical locations, so football stadiums, football clubs, you know, bars that have gigs, those guys 100% have got a lot of them already using our software and yeah, they can see what's going on now, who's here, all that kind of stuff. So you mentioned Instagram earlier as as a great example of, of one of your favorite social um, tools. What are the others, and can you give us some examples of how people are using Facebook mobile really well? Facebook or Instagram? Uh, you mentioned Instagram already. I was thinking, uh, what are your other favorite social um, social media? Uh, look, I mean, all, all, all of the regular ones, including, you know, I'm, I'm a big Twitter user as well. I love, I love Twitter. I think um, the really interesting challenge and opportunity for Twitter is, that location is really difficult to attach or to extract from tweets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, less than 5% of tweets are geotagged, so outright, here's my longitude latitude. Probably a, a decent chunk more than that would have some reference where you could imply location because they've mentioned the name of a place, an event, something that's going on. But what, what I find really interesting is Twitter, with their acquisition and subsequent launch of Vine, actually partnered with Foursquare to tag Foursquare place locations to Vines. So if you think through what that means and if that actually ever filters back into Twitter, you know, suddenly Twitter could very much be central to location because every tweet that goes out where it's relevant could be tagged to a physical environment. And then what that does is it unleashes in a massive data set around location. So you can think, you know, if you're watching the Giants game, in San Francisco, how many people are tweeting about that experience but you'd never be able to get to it because there's no longitude latitude, um, there might not be a mention of the team. But what happens if you allow users to tag back location and suddenly you can stitch together on Twitter, you know, the complete story of what's going on throughout the stadium? Um, so I think that's really a huge opportunity for Twitter and what I'm really excited about with Twitter and getting location-based businesses then to start sort of encouraging that kind of behavior. Um, almost like what Instagram have done with their kind of location-based tagging. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm So you also talked a little bit about video, but so that's, that's the, the area that nobody's really captured it. Do you have yeah, any no one's cracked that. into that? No, no one's really cracked it yet. I think Vine's really interesting for me because it feels like a halfway step between kind of a photo and a fully blown video experience. 
you're starting to see some brands doing some cool things on Vine. Um, and, you know, I, I hope Vine is successful because I think it's a cool app, but I think even if it's not successful, I think rolling that into the Twitter experience could be really cool to make sort of video a little bit more mainstream. It's really tough, though, to get it right, and I haven't seen too many examples of brands that have got, have got that right. But, you know, you're starting to see some fashion labels, you know, events, alcohol brands, we're doing some clever things with kind of video and, it, and it's really easy to go viral, particularly like a six second video. So I, I think it yeah. is a big opportunity. We, I probably can't put my finger on something that I said, like, you know, in video that I've seen that has kind of really nailed it yet. Right. Okay. Well, how are you guys doing? How are you doing over there, James? Good, yeah, no, I'm just, it, it, it's, um. Yeah, I, I find it incredibly fascinating this, in terms of this, the speed of, uh, of of new apps in this space coming onto the market. It was Kevin Rose, who's now at Google Ventures, had a really cool product um, uh, just before he joined Google Ventures, after he, after he kind of left Dig, which was called Oink, O-I-N-K, which was a, a location-based app where you could... Um, talk about and review the things the things in the place, not necessarily the place itself or what you were doing in the place. Um, and it was, it was one of those really cool apps, and I, I know myself and a lot of people kind of got really into it, and then they decided to kill the product. And there was that real feeling of like, ah, it's, a really cool, <laughs> it's a really cool product and you don't want to see it, see it go. And, and with the Instagram thing, obviously with, with, with Facebook, you, um, I, I, I'm, I'm in, interested to see how, those, how that all changes when they... Uh, obviously, they, they they got they bought Instagram what, for a billion dollars uh, well, about nine months ago. So I, I'm interested to see what what other people you know watching are are finding in terms of the changes that are going that are taking place with Instagram, or are they still kind of leaving it to its own devices. I mean, I think that the challenge in this space is, as you've said, there are so many new apps um, that come out on a regular basis that are really cool that don't kind of get the scale of Facebook or Instagram but have some really interesting data nonetheless. And I think that's kind of one of the problems that we're hoping to solve because each of those apps kind of lock the data of its users within that kind of silo and with that app. And it's really different to the web paradigm where Google can kind of crawl all the data and make sense of it and bring it together. Like with these apps, like you can't kind of crawl the data on a food spotting. Well, I mean, they actually, before they were acquired, they did actually set up a website. It's probably a poor example. But Oink, for example, you know, there's no way of crawling the data from within Oink. So it's really hard for brands and marketers and business owners to work out what the hell is going on when you've got Yelp and Oink and food spotting and Google Plus and Pinterest and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's like all just too much. Like, there are all these different places that you can share a photo of your food. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, there's going to be cool products. Some are going to come and some are going to go. I think the challenge is how do we make sense of it? How, how do we kind of stitch it together so that, you know, if I'm at an event or I'm at a restaurant, I can kind of see all of the data rather than having to open 15 different apps to kind of see what's happening there. And have you got a sense in terms of where the tipping point is for you that that data becomes useful? Do you, does it need to be... You know, you're you're bringing in stuff from a million people, or you know, what are the kind of numbers that make sense for you for your business? Where the smallest platform that we're pulling in data from is Foursquare, which I think is what got 30 million odd users, and there's really valuable data in that platform. So you know, possibly much smaller than that. There's just not enough scale globally to have any meaningful data. Um, but certainly from you know 30 million up. Um, there, there's really great data. Instagram is just incredible the volume, um, and we're, I'm just talking public data. Like obviously we don't get access to any of the private data on Facebook, so I, I couldn't comment on the volume, you know, at a particular pizza store. But certainly, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Foursquare, Facebook all have bucket load of bucket loads of data, and they become more and more valuable as they have more users in them. So, you know, if, if there is an app with only one or two million users unless it's a really niche defined audience in like a specific city or area, it doesn't add a lot of value kind of globally. I think that's a challenge and that's possibly why Oint shut down was they just couldn't break through that barrier to kind of get the global, you know, level of users they actually needed to sort of create a really sticky product. And, and with, with your, uh, obviously being so close to Asia as well, um, 
so China has its own version of of Twitter as well. Uh, how, how are you implementing with the? Or, uh, is that something you're thinking like for stage three of what you're doing that you're going to look at and trying to bring in that data? Stage fifteen, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, we, we've had a look at sort of Weibo, which is obviously you know really big in China. I suppose the markets that we're kind of the most interested in at the moment, like Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, um, even Taiwan. And in most of those markets, you know, the four platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, Foursquare, are pretty prevalent, and there's more than enough data for us to start engaging with businesses. Um, you know, if we didn't want to go to Hong Kong or to China, like clearly there are other platforms we need to integrate with. But for, you know, V1.0, you know, we've got a lot of data. Um, we can hit a bunch of markets. We've got some clients in the US who are using the tools as well. So we kind of have got a decent coverage just from those four. And, and what are the what are the kind of the the, the I suppose the KPIs the, the you know things that you're measuring every day when you get you know you get into the into the office or at the end of a day you're saying where are we on this what, what for your type of business what are those things you know how, what are your, the things you're measuring um, obviously like how many people sign up um, how many people come back how often they come back which features they're using and I think the thing for us as well is we're kind of thinking through, like the user interface doesn't necessarily have to only be web. Like what we're doing is trying to surface a nugget of insight when it occurs. Like, you know, could that be mobile? Could it be an alert could it be an email to a manager that, hey, James just walked into your store and this is about him. So I think the measurement will kind of change, obviously, as the product settles and as we get really good feedback about the parts that are resonating. Uh, but the vision for us is that like, we get the data to the right person at the right time that can actually make a difference to their business. Uh, but yeah, clearly the people who are signing up, that they're coming back, you know, what they're looking at is really important to us. I've, I've got this minority report image in my head now of the sales <laughs> assistant wearing their Google glasses, suddenly being pulled up the data that you're providing <laughs> saying this customer is, is, can't find this product then that information is also pulling up their Google Plus profile so they know a little bit about them, probably pulling in data from some of these personality testing companies that are, start, that are starting up now as well. So when you can actually go straight to that customer and say, ah, oh, I believe you're... Is that going to feel a little bit creepy? <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a minority report. I mean, we could do that now. I mean, we've yeah. got the technology, Google's got an API. If they let us hack on, on, you know, on the Glass API, we could probably have that done in a few months. So it's more about what are social norms, what would consumers expect, what, what a business is comfortable doing rather than the technology. Everything you've just said, we could probably build pretty quickly. Well, I did have an app on my iPhone three years ago, uh, and it was called Sneaky Pics, and it takes a picture every four seconds on your iPhone, so if you pretend like you're talking, you can go like this. If you see, and you're not, you're not going to believe this, I saw Pierce Brosnan swimming in a pool in the early morning in Calistoga at Solage, and I, I was like, oh my god, I was all by myself. Like, that's James Bond, right? And so I did the sneaky pics, and I pretended like I was talking on the phone, and I took like a ton of pictures of Pierce Brosnan swimming in the pool. So Google Glass is not doing anything new. You can just tell that they have it on. So Sneaky Picks actually, you didn't. He didn't really know what I was doing, except that I was really nervous. Like, <laughs> he's like, shaking. why are you taking photos of me? Like, yeah. no, 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 no. He didn't know because I was holding it up, and it would take a picture every four seconds, so I could move the camera. You right? Think that he didn't know, but I think that he knew. I said, hi, how are you doing? Oh, <laughs> yeah. And So anyway, but that's like Google Glass, but that's a little more stealth, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, though, if you're seeing Pierce Brosnan in a pool, are you going to say, okay, Glass, take a photo now? You're probably not, right? No. And you're not going to point like this, and you're not going to do that. It was like him, me, and his kid, and like nobody, like there were like two other people so if I did that with my phone, that would not have been very nice. Uh, probably not. No, I wouldn't do that. The reality is, so I was like, oh, I'm going to use my new app, Sneaky Pick, and, and then do that. So then just to see if it works, you know? 
But if you bought him a martini, he'd probably be like, oh, okay, you can have one. Actually, yeah, he have. did hang out with us. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the issue now. Yeah. Everyone's a paparazzi as well. Exactly. And so, you know, were you taking that photo, that could be up, you know, with the, like, probably a TMZ app, that could be up on TMZ within a couple of minutes, and this publicist is probably calling him 10 minutes after that saying, I think you might want to put some clothes on now. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a difference from putting your phone up like that, where people know, like, yeah, you're right, holding right. it. Are you checking your email, or are you taking a picture of me right now? You checking can tell there's a body one. language 20. to it. And Google Glass is pretty much a perpetual this. I'm taking a picture of you. So uh, I think it's one of the technologies here, right? So it's how society handles yeah, it's it. Here. Yeah, yeah. And, and how self is it? And, you know, and if I'm, glass is more I'm, obvious than I would say sneaky pics. So people are people have been doing it for at least three years, um, but but Google Glass makes it more open, actually. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I'm looking at you now with Google Glass and I can see everything you've tweeted, I can see, you know, marital status on Facebook, I can see where you were last night, where your Instagram photos, the place that you've been, like, is that going to be socially acceptable? And, well, and also, shared, yeah, I, I, you I, had to voluntarily share it on Google <laughs> or something, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and also that there's that whole thing of you know with your service with Facebook with any of them really if you're getting something for free then chances are your data is being sold you know that's that's kind of normally how it works um, yeah. so uh, something I'd be interested to see if, if as time goes on people start to think well you know I'm going to pay for that I'd rather pay fifty dollars a year to have the Facebook thing and then not give out my data and me not be served up ads I, I don't think we're anywhere near that, I'd, I'd, probably people don't realize just the amount of data that's available on them just now, and that data is not going to go away. It's going to you know, pretty much stay there forever. Um, and so for advertisers and marketers, it's fantastic, you know, because people are giving all this data uh, all the time. But for, uh, for individuals, um, I, I'd be interested to see how that changes over the next couple of years. And the volume is increasing, like, you know, every day the volume of Shared content increases, like there's just more and more and more. So I, I can't see that stopping anytime soon. All right. Well, hey, how, what time is it there in Australia? Uh, it, it's quarter to 11 in the morning, so it's quite disconcerting me watching you drink a glass of red wine. <laughs> well, well, it's getting past five o'clock here in Napa Valley, and we have gone over our time. And we have had so much fun. Actually, we did a little bit of a pre-show with you, which we we would love to you have recorded. Um, that have you, recorded. That was a little, little fun. Back <laughs> that was there. so much fun. Thank you so much, Jonathan Bruges, for joining us. And we Thanks everybody check check out Local Measure. And uh, hopefully you'll come back and tell us you've only been launching for six weeks or in the yeah. process of. So we would love to have you back along the way and, and continue to join us. Do you ever get to California in real life? Yeah, oh, look, I'm there every few, yeah, at least every few months. So I'd be, uh, last year I came over eight times. So next time I'll, I'll let you know and maybe I can have a glass of red wine in person. Yes, yeah. and we'll show you the difference between Sonoma and Napa wines, I which are both good. 20 minutes. Yes. 20 minutes. <laughs> Look, I mean, it doesn't, nothing, you've got nothing on Australian wine, but um, I'll, I'll have I to know, one the I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, and thank you, thank you, James Taylor. I see Allison, can yeah. she give us a wave I'll from the I'll back? I'll be asked to give a wave. Hey. Hi, Allison. <laughs> Um, and what what was the the website is uh, what was it get get, get local measure so just get localmeasure dot com or you can follow us at on Twitter at, at local measure as well. Okay. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Johnny Moda, for Thank joining you, me tonight. Thank you, for having me. Thank you, James, <laughs> for being here from Canada, and Jonathan from Australia. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Full yeah. circle. I, yeah. I noticed that you that you erased the whiteboard before the show. So. Yeah, we had all our top secret, you know, top secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, top and secret it, code. And also, thank you, Tablas Creek, for the wine tonight. We, I am enjoying it. It smells delicious. I, I, I bet, but I have a long drive. And yeah. I don't know.
So thank you everyone for joining us online and we will see Jonathan and James in the future and Johnny Moda as well. And uh, good night from Nava Valley. And good cheers. Night. Five o'clock. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> good night, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.